Springboard Roadshow Foundation. Legacy and Legacy. Be inspired. Be motivated. Be challenged. subject is uh, thinking outside your immediate environment or thinking globally. If you're an African, you are going to be dealing with huge global limitations. Part of it is discrimination. If you have a dark skin anywhere in the world, People are going to underestimate you before they even have the chance to evaluate you. So when you're a black person, you're always fighting from behind. Although we have a black man in the White House, it hasn't changed that notion very much. So for every African, every black person anywhere in the world, you fight extra hard just to get what other people have easily. You need to prove yourself uh, to have intelligence before you are credited with intelligence. Whereas, uh, if somebody was from a British or a French man or a white American, uh, people would assume that they are smart, even if they are not smart. Uh, in, in our part of the world, if somebody was a white man and walked through most of the streets of Ghana, uh, he would have access to great opportunity even when he hasn't done anything. The children will beg for money from him. The adults will look up to him. And when he sits at a meeting, people will assume that his opinions are superior. However, if you are a black person, you suffer great disadvantage. So, just being black has its own limitations that we have to fight. The location of our country, Ghana, and, and Africa itself geographically has a lot of limitations. What people forget is that much of Africa is desert. Much of it is dry. We have very unpredictable rainfall patterns. The geography of our continent doesn't help us much in so many of the things we want to do. So these are things beyond us. You can't do much about your skin color and you cannot change the, con the, the, the position of Ghana. You can't move Ghana from here and go and put it somewhere in Switzerland. Uh, it wouldn't work. Ghana is Ghana where it is. Nigeria is Nigeria where it is. These are things you can't do much about. Apart from that, we have continental challenges. Our continent is the home of the poorest countries in the world. Uh, West Africa is home to some of the poorest countries in the world. Um, I read somewhere that of the five poorest countries in the world, four of them are located in West Africa. So you are neighbor to people who have nothing. Now, when your neighbors have nothing and you need something, you have no one to go to for something because they have nothing. Uh, so at the continental level, not just our country, but the surrounding countries have a lot of challenges. Our African Union, uh, which changed its name from Organization of African Unity to African Union, I really don't understand the change of name, but it happened. Uh, we became uh, AU and moved the O from the OAU, uh, but still has remained where it was. Uh, very little happens at the AU. It seems Almost every time they meet, they are trying to wait for everybody to come along to get something done. Because Africans somehow think that for something to be done, everybody must be part of it. And when we have to strike out on our own, we find it very difficult to do that. So you find that uh, most of our nations are not doing well because they are waiting for the AU to work, they are waiting for the ECOWAS to work, and we're waiting for something to work before we work. Uh, however, I, I think, from my point of view, uh, there are three major problems that if we don't fix, we can't set the stage
for our citizens to play on the global level. The first one is national identity. For some reason, we don't have identity for Ghanaians. We've tried national identity, you know, I don't know about you, but I was counted and my picture was taken and um, I still haven't seen the card. So I, I don't know what they did with my picture and, and all the information somebody came to collect from me. But when you have a nation where you can't even identify the people, it creates serious problems for business and so on. I'm going to touch on that very soon. So national identity is very important. And unfortunately, in the last election, I didn't hear anybody talk about national identity. It seems trivial, but it's so critical to where we, if we want to be a, a, a global player. Second is house address. House address. We make fun of it, but you know it's very difficult to locate a Ghanaian. First, he has no identity, and second, you can't tell where he stays. Now, if you have a country of people whom you can't identify by name and cannot locate by residence, you don't have citizens. You have people, but you can't deploy them for any meaningful endeavor. You can't tax them effectively. You can't rally them for any major work. So, national identity, house address. The third major problem we face in Ghana is land management. Land management. Uh, anybody who's bought land in Ghana will tell you you have to buy it, at least when you're going to buy land, uh, and they tell you it's going to cost you uh, 5000 per plot or 10000 per plot, just put 20000 down. Because you will pay one and pay another tribe and pay another family and, and pay everybody uh, and then go to land commission and continue the payment. So uh, by the time you buy your land, you've paid for it four times. What has all this got to do with growth? You know, you know the reason why interest rates are very high in Ghana, although inflation is very low? Because the risk for doing business here is very high for the banks. And why is it very high? Because they don't know the people. And they can't locate where the people live. And when somebody brings a property for collateral, you can't trust it. So the banks have to hedge and they have to charge you twice knowing that something will go wrong. And so we all pay for the inefficiencies of the society. If we want to do global business, these three basic problems should be fixed. If they are not fixed, we can build nice roads and nice buildings and nice houses and, and, and build all kinds of fanciful things, but the root, the foundation of it is weak. You go to many countries and you find interest rates for banks are very, very affordable. They, they're doing 4%, 6%, 10%. I'm talking about African countries. And you come to Ghana and you're blessed if you get 25%. People are borrowing to do business at the rate of 5% per month through microfinancing schemes. 5% per month, that is 60%. How much profit can you make to service a 60% loan facility? And so why are we paying all these high loans? Because we have no national identity, you don't know anybody, and you can't identify anybody. You don't know where anybody stays. If he tells you, I stay here, uh, you, you can't guarantee it. Uh, and, and if he gives any property, you can trust it. So everything is very expensive. As a result of that, although the Ghanaian economy seems to be growing, and we all appreciate all the great things happening in our country and the beautiful places we can identify, although all of that is happening, you find out that the cost of doing business in Ghana is extremely high. Extremely high. 
it takes about three times the amount to construct a one kilometer road in Ghana than in some of our neighboring countries in West Africa. I'm not even talking about Europe and other places in West Africa. So, if we construct one kilometer road in Ghana, in other African countries, the same amount will construct three kilometers of road. The question we have to ask ourselves is why is it so hard for a young person who starts business to succeed? It's so hard because the cost for doing business is very, very high. So at the national level, you find that we have problems to deal with for young people who want to start business. At the continental level, we have problems. At the global level, we have problems. Then at the personal level, we have problems too. We have, I believe, developed over a long period of time a slow way of doing things. So generally, uh, I'm not sure whether the sun, the heat of the sun has any contribution to it. Maybe the sun is so hot, we sweat so much, so we want to conserve energy, so we move slowly. It could be. The sun is so hot. If you move too fast, you sweat, you burn too much calories. Living in Ghana is like living in a sauna. So, you know, you're burning energy. So maybe because of that, we are slow. But the world stage functions on speed. So if you have developed a response to life that is very slow, and you're competing with people who are very fast, you're always going to be behind. So, if we're going to compete globally, at the personal level, we have to accelerate our decision-making process, our reaction time, and, and our speed of thought and action. So if somebody has a job that should take one hour to do, it shouldn't take one week to do it. Because if you do that, you're wasting a lot of time. So speed is going to be required. The other thing that I think at the personal level needs some change is the thinking, the scale of our thinking. When I say scale, I'm talking about the size of our thinking. You know, one of the things that have fascinated me uh, is in the last few years is something called fast food in Ghana. And our young people like fast food. I'm sure these St. John students like fast food. And normally when we talk about fast food, we are talking about uh, what is fast food? What are we talking about? Fried rice and chicken. And, uh, you know, these days uh, I've seen Kentucky Fried Chicken has also shown up in Ghana. Uh, and, uh, you know, we talk about all these fast food and, 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 you know, people go outside Ghana, they want to eat a McDonald's, you know, fast McDonald's or a hot dog and so on and so forth. But, you know, we, we've had fast food in Ghana all our lives, as, as far as I'm concerned, when I, I grew up on fast food. It was called Yokogari. Yokogari is fast food. Wache is fast food. Kinky and fish is fast food. Ekwekbemi is fast food. Koku and Kose is fast food. What is fast food? Food that you get fast. That's all. But why don't we see that? Because the scale has remained the same. The same way we do Yokogari 
and, and the way we do wache has remained on the same scale. Once somebody goes, boils some beans, gets a pan, and, and collects the beans, puts it in a pan, sits down, and, and, and gets some rice or gets some gari here and gets some oil. And this, since I was a kid, and I was a kid quite some time ago before some of you were born, uh, the way yokogari was sold, the scale of it is still the same. I haven't seen anybody yet being able to take this on a higher scale, mass produce it, franchise it, and take it all over the country and export it all over the world. After all, we eat the Chinese food in Ghana. Can't the Chinese eat Ghanaian food? They can if the scale can go up. Now, why is it that we keep things at the level we are? There is something called the thinking of smallness, smallness. Everybody says smallness. Most times I like to call it village mentality. But village mentality, I don't think does justice to it. It's smallness. Smallness. Think small, act small, believe small, and do small. When you have a mindset of smallness, you are easily satisfied. You are easily happy. But if you're doing business which thrives on competition, then smallness can become sometimes a liability. There are times when smallness can be beautiful. But in the business environment, smallness is not always smart. Because if you remain small, somebody will grow big and swallow you up and take you over. Smallness. Smallness sometimes has its appeal. When you think small, we do think small. We somehow feel safe and secure. So smallness gives a lot of security. If you talk to the average person, maybe some of the young people here, what they want to do in future. And they start telling you what they want to do in future. You would find they will express ideas. I want to do this and I want to do that and I want to do that. And I have come to notice that that question is answered differently in different parts of Ghana. Depending on several socio-cultural uh, factors. But you find that the average person is not really thinking about something that will change the world, but is thinking about something that will probably change his life and maybe change his family's life and his friend's life. But he's not thinking about a global idea, something that will hit the rest of the world. Smallness has its appeal, but it can be a major problem. When you have smallness, you are easily seducted by your success. I remember when I was a kid, I grew up in a particular uh, town or, or city, I think it's a city in Ghana, I wouldn't mention the name. Uh, but this was years ago in the 60s. And this man, who was in our neighborhood, uh, won the lottery. Won Lotto. And uh, I'm not sure what the amount was. We didn't ask him. But everybody knew he had won Lotto. And the man went to... He didn't buy a vehicle, but he went to hire a vehicle and bought several crates of beer in the vehicle. It was open top. And he opened the crates of beer. He had one bottle of beer in the right hand and the other in the left hand, and he was pouring it all over the streets as the vehicle was going. And when the, the, the beer finishes, he just picks another bottle and pours it. And his, his language was, I used to be a poor man. I didn't used to have anything. But look at me now, I'm rich. 
and I can pour beer on the street. Now, the reason he did that was because his mind was small. Why? Because the amount, and I'm not sure it was a big amount, blew his mind so much he had no usage for the money except to use it that way. That is an extreme case. But it also shows what happens when you have a small mind. When you have small mind, big things blow your mind. Big things blow your mind. So let me ask you a question. The young people here from St. John's and other people, what would you do if somebody gave you today a million dollars? Somebody would say, hey! Million! Are you sure million? Yeah, yeah. What would you do? If you honestly consider it, most of us would not know what to do. Because most of the things you have dreamt about in life, by the time you spend 10,000 of that one million, all your dreams have been fulfilled. <laughs> it's called smallness. You know, when I was young, I had great dreams. And part of my dream was that when I start working, I would, I would eat what we call gari sokis, you know, gari sokis, with one tin of milk. It was a dream, which I fulfilled. But, you know, because when, when we were young, you know, when, when we're going to take milk, you know, my mother was the sharer of milk in our home. And she would you know out the milk tin, you know, they, they punch a hole on one end, punch a hole on the other end, and you bring your teaspoon. And she pours, do, 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 do. it's full. And you turn it, two. That's it. it. It colors and makes whatever you are drinking a bit whitish, but you can't taste milk. So my life dream was to grow up and drink one tin of milk on Gary, which I fulfilled, by the way. Strangely, I don't drink milk now. Because I realized that dream, although I thought it was a big dream, it was a small dream. But there are people who still can't improve on their childhood dream. So their dream of drinking milk remains the same. So when wealth comes, after they've drunk their milk, the rest, they have nothing to do with it. And that's why in Ghana, most people who go up, the rest of the money, they are going to chase girls with it because they have no plan for the money. If you had planned for the money, you would not let a 16-year-old spend your hard-earned money, which you can invest to do something great and something significant. Why do people do that? It's not that they like women. It's because their brain is small. Their ideas are small. They are small-time thinkers. And the amount of money they have received far exceeded every dream they have ha had in life. And the dreams have already been fulfilled. One of my other dreams was to eat one bar of chocolate. Four. I had great dreams when I was a child. Great dreams. And I'll never forget when I started working and I bought one chocolate, golden tree chocolate. And uh, you didn't have to break the rectangles. One, no, no, no. I bought the whole thing and I ate the whole thing. Vision accomplished. I have drunk my one tin of milk. I have eaten my one chocolate. I had another dream too. To stand in front of the kebab seller and just eat the kebab until I was satisfied, which was also fulfilled. 
But then after you have fulfilled all those, you realize those were childish dreams. Now you become an adult. What new ideas do you have? Beyond eating. What are the ideas? Can you imagine what will happen if somebody had such a childish dream and doesn't change it, rises through the ranks, becomes a government official or some big man somewhere? How their lives will be lived. When you think small, you are easily satisfied. So, to play on the world stage, some things have to change. They have to change at the big level. Globally, we have to do something about our corporate image. The black people don't matter much. And we have to make an effort, deliberate effort, to change that impression. It doesn't have to be one man's effort. It has to be all of us as Africans, as black people, making sure that wherever we go, we are not just representing ourselves, we are representing a race of people who for hundreds of years have been looked down on. And our aim should be, let us not reinforce that image. If they think you are not smart, be smart. If they think you can't think, think. If they think you can plan, plan. If they think you are lazy, work extra hard. Because you're not just doing it for yourself. You're doing it to erase centuries of discrimination against people with your skin pigmentation. Until we are able to do that, we're always going to work extra hard just to achieve average success. Because the world will always deal with us from afar. At the continental level, we have to do some things differently. This is my personal view. I don't think Africans need the AU, and I don't even think we need ECOWAS. I think African nations should take their destinies into their own hands and build viable nations. We should focus on building strong nations and then strong continent. But just trying to build a strong continent will not work. And I think that we as citizens must help our nations to see things from that perspective. At the national level, I believe that there are things that need to happen in this country to create the infrastructure for the average person to succeed. If you got the idea of Facebook in Ghana, could you have built a global business with Facebook? If you got the ad idea of an iPad, could you have done it? Would your product have gone all over the world? If you had a great fashion idea, would you become a Giorgio Armani? Would you, can your business transcend the Africanness that has become the label? It can, but the challenge is far more than somebody who is starting already with all the advantages. At the personal level, we have to start to think beyond childish dreams and start thinking about making a significant contribution to our world. It is more than building a house, eating good food, wearing good clothes. It is how you are going to leave a legacy that the world will remember way after you have gone. I believe that our generation of Africans can make a significant contribution. We can compete with the rest of the world and we can hold our head very high. For the young people who are here who dream big dreams, your dreams will be challenged. Your dreams will come against obstacles. Some of the obstacles will be obstacles in our society. 
Sometimes it will be the whole system fighting you. Sometimes it will be people who you know fighting you. But if you believe in your dream strong and well enough, push it and make it work. So that the next time when we talk about brands to come and support Springboard, beside MTN, we will have your initials somewhere. Representing a company which has become global. That when we read about great people, we will not just talk about Bill Gates and Steve Jobs. The world will talk about you too. And me too. But that journey is going to be traveled intentionally. We have to choose to go that journey. We have to work extra hard. We have to put in a lot of work, a lot of work. And if we can do that, we can build that future that we so desire. I wish you the best uh, throughout the Springboard Festival and the rest of the towns and cities that will be uh, visited to all the young men and women who will come to listen. I pray that something will be ignited in everybody's heart, that they wouldn't just get excited, that when they leave Springboard, something will happen that will have global consequences, that will change their life and their generation forever. God bless you, and enjoy the rest of the program. And the spirit.